Well, thank you so much for joining us on this training today. This training is for physicians, for office managers, for consultants, for office staff, and for compliance officers. We are Healthcare Compliance Solutions. And my name is Lance King, presenting today. Now, those of you who have been in our last trainings, you'll know a little bit about me. I'm the Vice President of Sales at Healthcare Compliance Solutions. And I'm passionate about helping practices to become compliant because my family has been involved in identity theft and having our information stolen and, and abused. And boy, that took a lot of time to recover from that, years actually, to completely recover. And it definitely left a mark and in terms of awareness. And so why am, why am I here? Why am I a part of Healthcare Compliance Solutions? Well, a big part is because I want to make sure that patient information, that we can ensure it's not leaked out onto the internet or shared you know, uh, on some of these websites where people are sharing individual healthcare records for about $300. Furthermore, there are hackers out there that are taking patient information and then they're putting them in front of uh, doctors and saying, hey, uh, we're, we're holding this up for hostage, uh, as a hostage, and, and you can pay us X amount of money unless, uh, or, or else we're gonna release this information out. So just a, a lot of nasty things happening, and a big goal of mine is to, to just make sure that people understand their responsibilities within the healthcare practice so that they can not only have a culture of compliance, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, but to make sure that patients are safe, to make sure that your staff is safe. So in the presentation today, we're gonna to take you on a journey. Specifically, the aim is to cut the fat for compliance officer duties. Uh, that's, that's the main theme of the presentation. We are constantly asked, why are there so many compliance officer duties? Uh, there's just, there's a, 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 a huge list. And in this list, there are multiple other lists that we know office staff have and, and, and many of those, those other lists feel like more of a priority. So let's cut the fat with compliance officer duties and, and really get to the, the meat and the heart of what's gonna be required in your practice. I'm also going to introduce an incentive program. Many of you are aware, uh, at least our customers that are on the line, those of you that are looking at HCSI for the first time, we have an incentive program that involves $100. Every time you, you share HCSI with, with someone, uh, well, we, we mail you a $100 gift card. Well, we've, uh, we've seen a lot of traction with this and we want to, to make sure that you know as uh, holidays are, are coming up that uh, if, if you're willing to share HCSI, well, we're, we're willing to up the ante a little bit. So I'll roll out uh, the red carpet for that incentive program in just, just a little bit. So I wanna know, you know, what's your story? What's, what's your why? Uh, in the comments underneath the video, you'll see an area for you to type in just a, a quick why. why. What motivated you or what motivates you in your position to do what you do? I'm just curious because I, I spoke with just yesterday an individual who had a business degree and then 
today is now an office manager, and I wanted to know how that happened. What was the real motivating factor behind that? I know some of the things that she said was she enjoys communicating to parent or to patients. She enjoys patient care. She enjoys applying business principles in a healthcare environment. If you wouldn't mind, just, just let me know. I'm just curious as to what motivates you in your position. Now, why that motivation? Well, I, I'm <laughs> a big reason why I'm curious is because I know you've got a checklist, a, a real laundry list of items that you have to get done every single day. In fact, as soon as you wake up and get to the office, you're probably faced with two major obstacles. Do I, uh, do I focus on, on putting out fires initially, or should I let those wait till the end of the day and focus on patient care? Because we, we've talked with thousands of healthcare practices and have our program throughout the United States, we get a chance to learn about a lot of different concerns. And one of the biggest concerns we found is, again, this checklist uh, really prevents a lot of people from integrating a culture of compliance. In fact, many people feel like they're chasing white rabbits down rabbit holes like, like Alice in Wonderland. And the real problem with that is at many different points, uh, you'll be going down this rabbit hole only to find a Cheshire cat asking you about where do you really want to go? And so again, with, with your why, we must understand our why so that we can understand our how. Okay, our why gives us a real motive for action. Now, with compliance, yes, it's not as high on the priority list. A lot of people would say that it's not because they struggle with making business decisions. Now, you may say, well, no, I, that's not it at, at all, Lance. Well, let me share, share a, a brief uh, analogy and, and see if I can tie this in. Uh, hopefully, this can be instructive for you. There was a man who had uh, done a, a bunch of things in his life that were very, very much uh, outside of the scope of, of what normal people get to do. Uh, he had flown airplanes, he had a helicopter, pilot's license, and, uh, and decided one day he wanted to, to get in a race car. Now, there was some apprehension <laughs> Uh, in fact, he told the instructor, boy, I just, I just don't know how I'm going to be able to, to do what you guys do on the track. You really do some incredible things. And so, uh, at any rate, he ended up getting lessons from this instructor. And on one of the lessons, uh, there were certain turns that, as they're navigating the turn, there are different obstacles put in the path. So, for instance, uh, oil or a block to simulate having a car there or having real oil on the track. And going around one of the corners, this, this man said that the tires slipped out from under him and he literally started spinning in his car. Now, gave him a little bit of comfort knowing that the instructor was next to him, but the instructor just sat there wasn't in a panic, but this driver was. So much so, he said he, he says he had one of those life flash before his eyes type of a, a moment that was being simulated through his, through his mind. And uh, he said as, as it was happening, he, he, saw, he saw the wall that they were headed toward, and he just thought, boy, I am dead. Okay, <laughs> there's, there's no coming out of this spin. I have no idea what I'm doing. So, so this is all coming into his mind as he's looking to the wall. Well, what, what do you think the instructor did? Uh, as an instructor, what would you do in, in this circumstance to, of course, not hit the wall and die? 
comment in the comment section below. Okay, not die. It's probably a good answer. Uh, the, the question is how? Well, here is what the instructor did. So they're in a tailspin. This individual, the driver, is just just sweating bullets, and I mean, they're, they're headed for this wall. Well, they're just about to hit the wall. The instructor grabs the driver's head and turns it toward the track. Turns his head toward the track. Well, you may, may guess that the natural correction happened and they did not hit the wall but started course correcting and heading toward the track now why why share this story well many of us are in very different positions watching this webinar and i just want to place emphasis on the, the fact that what we focus on is what we get. They, the driver kept focusing on the wall. What was he going to get? Well, he was going to get a whole lot of wall, okay, and he may have died. What's instructive in this analogy is that the, the coach turned his head so that he focused on really what was the most important part and that was to, to navigate the track. So what I'm gonna suggest is that you have both hands on the wheel and that really you, you do what you can to immerse yourself in understanding the concepts today. Because again, we understand that you have a big list of things to do, okay? And we understand that you have patience, maybe even patience like this.
Okay, so <laughs> hopefully you don't have uh, difficult patients like Elaine in that in that episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> but I, I imagine you, you do have some some of your own unique challenges with patients, and as difficult as it can be to protect their information, uh, it really, uh, it really every every effort makes a difference. Now another task we recognize that you have is communicating to staff, which involves training, which involves uh, front desk daily opportunity, uh, daily objectives, and we realize you have a lot of other administrative tasks. So there's a lot on this checklist and a big challenge a lot of our customers have told us and a lot of people we talk with is, hey, I've got these these monkeys, <laughs> you know, how do I how do I get these compliance monkeys off my back? <laughs> and and they all come uh, with uh, with their own unique personalities, right? So focusing on helping you not only get the compliance monkeys off your back, but but creating that culture. We're going to talk about daily, quarterly, and annual responsibilities, and as I mentioned, really cut through the fat on this so that you can focus on doing the things that really are absolute priorities, making sure you're making the most of your time. So daily, uh, with any security incidents, proper sanction policies should be enforced, and Anytime you do have any incidents, staff should be retrained, right? A lot of these that you're seeing are created because things have happened in the past. So sanction policies, typically there are three different levels. So level one would be, uh, an example would be an a, a fax was accidentally sent or an email with the wrong protected health information okay so what you want to do uh, one one thing that that you want to have in force here is a notice of privacy policy and if somebody did breach a, a level one sanction you should have a uh, something that's commensurate a consequence that's commensurate to whatever the breach was. A level two sanction would be, an, ex an example would be sharing PHI because the person is found, uh, found it to be interesting. Uh, and that can include identifying a patient diagnosis, treatment, photos, etc. So someone finds uh, something to be interesting and, and, and record snooping is, is a very common reason that a lot of practices end up being in a position of an audit. Now level three is when somebody uses PHI to cause harm or to get gain, okay? And, and if there are any of you on this call that have ever been in a position where uh, you've had patient information and somebody has asked to buy it from you, have, some, have, an, have the integrity to, to do the right thing there, okay? Now, some of the things, just, just a few examples of what to do. So with EPHI, make sure that it's supervised when a third party is accessing any of your computers. Make sure office, the office creates a log of users' activity on information systems containing EPHI. And then another is uh, make sure that your employee records are kept separate from your patient records. I know that sounds simple. It, it is pretty simple, but the, you know sometimes there are smaller offices and a lot of things tend to blend together. Creating access controls and validation procedures is, uh, that's kind of a remedy of, uh, you know, again, when we talked about third-party access, if you have access controls and validation procedures, 
privacy warnings on emails. It's important that your staff understand how to identify a breach and who to go to. There should be a HIPAA compliance officer that has an idea of these specific procedures, uh, these specific duties, and then that individual's supposed to understand what then would be required if there was a breach in terms of notifying all those who were uh, who had the breach of patient information. So the next part of this that's daily, there are a lot of forms. Uh, those forms I mentioned with the audit logs, that's, that's part of, of the forms that should be customized based on your office. I've put in, in uh, parentheses business associate contracts. This is something that can change quite a bit. And so uh, daily, I only put that as, as an emphasis because you really should make sure that tomorrow, for instance, that you have all your business associates that have signed the contract, that it's dated, and we often encourage our customers to call the business associates to make sure that they have done training and they are doing everything to make sure all the patient information they're using is being kept safe and that, uh, and one thing additionally I'll say with this is to make sure that the exchange of information, you're only giving them the minimum amount of information that's required for that business associate relationship. And then record complaints. Not that complaints happen daily, but it's something to be aware of. Something is an ongoing uh, duty is data backup. And we suggest that that's something done weekly. And there are a lot of programs out there to help automate that if your records are online. Also, all your training logs. Are you having meetings on a regular basis and having people sign and date a training log saying that they have been updated on any compliance updates? It's been said this is probably the most neglected of any of the duties is training. And so make sure that you have a way of, of being up to date and then make sure you're getting together with your staff and you're talking together about some of the changes, making sure everybody understands, hey, this is what is going on. Here's some of the changes with HIPAA security. Uh, here's what we're gonna do with this risk assessment. I need some help. And then you can delegate and, and have everybody help out. Okay, some of these things take a group effort. So that's why we recommend that, that training, for instance, should be done on a quarterly basis. The next is billing and privacy audits. There are forms that go along with that. And then a facility, environment, and IT security plan. And, uh, and that's something that, that goes a little bit more in depth. A lot of times you'll have to have an IT company uh, help out after you've assessed which protocols you have in place. If you have a company like HCSI, you'll have online and you'll have hard copies that give you all of the protocols, all the remedies for any of the risk factors that you need. And so with an IT company, after you've gone through those, you can say, hey, can you help me make sense of the IT portion? I need to make sure we have everything that's up to date. Now, when I say up to date, I'm gonna give you an example of, of uh, what has been a huge blunder for the dental industry, and many people are still unaware and haven't done anything about it. So, so Dentrix is uh, an encryption software that recently they received a fine that was right around $300,000. Now, why did they receive a fine like that? It's because there were multiple letters, multiple uh, contacts with uh, about this software 
that to where HIPAA was saying, the Office of Civil Rights was saying, hey, your encryption is not up to snuff. It is not meeting our standards, and you're going to put a lot of people in a position of harm. And so make sure that everything's up to date. Uh, I don't know what Dentrix is doing. I know they're a good company, and they're they're going to. Uh, my guess is they're they're probably updating and and uh, making sure everybody's up to speed. But HIPAA traditionally, if you look at all the security systems that are put into place in different industries, you know, banking and investing and finance, it traditionally hasn't been the strongest platform, which is why today we're seeing so many cybersecurity breaches. So I've mentioned a bunch of forms. Here's just a, a list. Now it's, it's probably, uh, I didn't want this to be in focus. I just wanted you to see HIPAA privacy forms on the top and HIPAA security forms. These are the forms that we offer our customers. And the, these are the forms that on a regular basis, should be incorporated. You need to be aware of these forms because if an auditor comes in, they're gonna check to see dates and documentation. So you've gotta have this available. So just a snapshot, a little walkthrough of HIPAA privacy and security. So just to kind of bring things into focus a little bit more. Uh, employees, okay? Anybody that comes in to your practice Employees and visitors must wear ID badges. Employees uh, must challenge anybody not seeing them. And then it's important to just remember that when you're speaking about protected health information, you speak softly. And when appropriate, use a non-public area. Now, an example of this I recently heard about a consultant who had a doctor talking about patient information in front of a group of inquirers. Uh, well, they were just kind of surrounding. The patient got embarrassed that these people were hearing what was going on and got upset at the doctor. The doctor didn't feel like it was his fault. The patient ran away. Well, not ran away, but <laughs> you get the idea. The patient leaves. The office manager who was overhearing said, hey, doctor, you really need to, to get on the phone and call him and apologize. He's going to, you know, he, he's an example of, of uh, somebody that could turn us in and then we could be out of it. We, broke, we, breached the uh, we breached his privacy and so it's our responsibility. Well, the doctor wouldn't do it. And the office manager really got after the doctor. Doctor, you, you've got to call. Okay, we have committed to keep this information safe and uh, you know, we shouldn't have been in this, this particular area where other people could overhear. Well, it took three times. It, it took the office manager saying, doctor, get on the phone and call that person back right now before the doctor acted. Now, doctors, if, if you're watching and, and you've ever been in a situation like that, hopefully you'll just take the lead. Okay, as far as workstations, we've, we've touched on this just a little bit. And for your information, HIPAA really is going to be a big emphasis in this. We we'll move a little faster when we get into OSHA and Medicare. So with workstations, kind of an obvious thing, right? They should be positioned so that people in the, in the foyer can't see what, what's going on, right? Uh, you shouldn't share, share passwords, uh, user IDs. If you're posting user IDs on a sticky note, come on, there, there, <laughs> there's a much more uniform way of doing that. Also, uh, we've talked about P documents, or we've talked about monitors, but documents with PHI should be also kept from unauthorized view. So if you have in, in uh, the office some cubbies, uh, probably a better place to, to file things. Things should be filed face down uh, in, uh, uh, you know, a file or uh, just stored somewhere where, where they're protected. Also, as you can see, computers that aren't in use, they should go to a login screen automatically. 
If you don't know how to do that, that's kind of what an IT team uh, should help you with. Or, hey, you can call HCSI and we're happy to help you with that. Laptops, PDAs, and other portable devices are uh, stored after hours with a lock. Uh, we've had a business associate who was using a laptop take home his laptop and have that stolen. That had a lot of patient information. That had a lot of healthcare providers very nervous about that information being stolen. We hear all the time, it's a very common thing for laptops to be taken. Uh, probably the most common is it's the story of the, the laptop being left in the car and the car being broken into. So, uh, I don't know. It, it seems like common sense, and you may be rolling your eyes, but this is, this is happening. PHI is, is shredded or discarded in a secured container. Okay, as far as access, so doors with access control mechanisms, locks, swipe cards. Now this, of course, uh, it always depends on, on uh, you, you may have to get creative with a smaller office versus a larger office. This is kind of more for, for a larger office. And then uh, computer room, if you have one of those, it's restricted to authorized personnel. Backups of protected health information are secured in a safe area. Uh, Off-site is what the law says, and not near public areas. And then faxes, printers, and copiers should be limited to authorized staff. Now you may say, well, that's very common sense. Uh, but, but why is that, that there? Well, um, we have learned that copiers, fax machines, and printers, they store information and telephone numbers in there and there are ways of people stealing those telephone numbers and uh, and taking that information for personal use so yeah uh, make sure that uh, you limit this authorized staff office doors filing cabinets and desks should be closed and locked and then uh, certainly if you have the ability to do an alarm Oops, excuse me and then smoke detectors and fire extinguishers should be operational and accessible. There we go. Uh, we've, we had a, a lady turn a doctor in because there uh, were too many cords. And this is, you could say this is more of an OSHA thing in terms of workplace safety. But uh, she was, the, the doctor was found to be in breach with a lot of, a lot of compliance issues. And it caused such a big fine that, from what I understand, they had to shut their doors down. I mean, such a, uh, such a small thing, but hundreds of thousands of dollars can result from, from a fine. Uh, you know, the fines, you know, per fine, you, can, you could have up to $50,000, depending on, on uh, the risk that uh, is implied there. Okay, so that's kind of a HIPAA privacy and HIPAA security walk through there. Okay, now with OSHA, moving right along, personal protective equipment should always be worn. Always, always, always. We have a consultant that said that one of the reasons that she decided to be a dental consultant is because so many of the offices, she worked in, in several offices as an office manager, and she said that uh, there, were, there were so many instances where things weren't being cleaned the way it needed to, people weren't wearing their PPE. And, and so she wanted to make sure that if people, if there were offices, if there were other offices as bad as the offices that she was working at, that she gave them a big kick in the booty, <laughs> in a sense. Daily, again, with customized forms, the forms are huge. Forms are so important. Again, understanding these forms will help you to understand what is more of a, a daily thing. Now, certainly uh, OSHA, not everything is, is, complete, is daily, and I'll get into more of the quarterly and annual. And then a code of, of conduct. Okay, do you have a code of conduct? Do you have anything on the wall that suggests the values of your organization? Okay, if you think about culture, 
everybody comes from different backgrounds, different value systems. Okay, but if, if you want to really give people a vision of how you're going to serve your practice and what kind of culture, well, culture is just a collection of values, really, and what you care about. So your code of conduct is extremely important. And if you don't already have something that you've developed, well, I'm going to give you some encouragement today. Quarterly, uh, labeling, labeling of rooms, labeling of, of equipment, labeling of chemicals, Labeling is something that quarterly you've got to check to make sure everything's up to date. Are you not having people come in to, to upgrade and to update things? Make sure you're labeling. Posters, okay? Look around your office. Are your posters the same? Okay, <laughs> things, things are changing. A safety plan for fire, building, electrical, and workplace. Quarterly. This is a risk assessment that is going to take communication. And so just under it is training documentation. When you're training and you're documenting that you're training, delegate out these responsibilities. Okay. And, and in some cases, you may need to automate. I, I love what, what a guy named Rory Vaden said about making these types of business decisions. When you're faced with any business decisions, it's important first to see if you can eliminate it, second to see if you can automate it, third see if you can delegate, or fourth procrastinate on purpose and then, and then push that off. Now this is something that, yeah, uh, if, if you've been procrastinating this for a while, <laughs> let's start today or, or get ready in, in a couple of months to do a 360 degree overview of of your, your risk management plan for, for OSHA and for HIPAA. Material data sheets, uh, <laughs> if you're, uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, with these sheets, and so uh, I'm just going to get right into annual workplace controls, waste management plan, customized procedures, Okay, HIPAA and OSHA require location-specific and practice-specific policies and procedures. And, and again, what's implied in procedures is that after they're developed, you're going to implement a, an action plan. And this action plan is, is what <laughs> requires culture because it requires help from, from different departments, uh, sometimes help from different companies to make sure you're on track. If an auditor comes in, uh, they're going to want to see these custom procedures, so hopefully you have a binder where all your, your policies and procedures are, are in that binder and they're ready to go. Okay, if there are tabs and it's, it's got everything up to date, an auditor is probably just going to flip through that binder, say, have a nice day and move on to the next practice. Very, very important. And then work area and non-work area, uh, this will also help a lot with HIPAA. So here are all the forms we offer. As you can see at the bottom, there's quite a few different risk assessment checklists. And these are things that we've heard some people will have on their walls, just like they would a poster, because these are things that, that they want their staff to constantly be reviewing. And if they're reviewing it, hopefully autonomy has been created within different people's positions where people feel like they're com they can be comfortable enough to just take care of business and to do what needs to be done. Okay, so there's OSHA. Now with Medicare, with all the ongoing, 10 days after hire, all those that help out with billing should have training and it should be documented. There should be certificates in that binder that the auditor sees where they can take a look and see who has done training and, and which what which training has been done okay periodically spot check coding i'll tell you what my wife and i had our daughter go to the uh the intensive care unit uh, i guess it's been about two years 
Uh, she had uh, rhinovirus, adenovirus, uh, RSV, and uh, ended up getting pneumonia. And, and we were there for a long time. And uh, boy, there were a lot of codes that <laughs> were, were being used. In fact, she did code, which, which was really sad. Uh, she, she pulled out, though. She's, uh, she's a result. Kids are, are super resilient, thank goodness. <laughs> But uh, after that whole incident, we, we were billed for something. And, uh, and, and what, what we saw on the bill uh, was, was quite startling, the, the number. Uh, and, and we just double-checked with the hospital and said, we should have had this covered. Absolutely, we should have had this covered. And they, they said, nope. I'm sorry, that's, uh, that was the correct code. And anyway, it came to be that, uh, that the code was, was not supposed to be used for us uh, and uh, insurance would have covered anything around that. And at any rate, it was, was taken care of, thank goodness. And, and as we've had, we have things like ICD-10 and yes, nobody, you know, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, <laughs> I, I realized that, that it's, uh, that's, that was a very arduous transition for a lot of you. I heard about it for months, uh, and I'm still hearing about it. Uh, but, but that uh, should be checked quite periodically. Semi-annually, we recommend auditing your program, okay? And then make sure to document the audits. And if there are any issues, make sure to do corrective and preventative action. The last part of this is uh, is make sure, and this is an ongoing basis, make sure implementation, coordination, and evaluation of procedures and programs uh, take place. And, and this can require a team effort. And again, sometimes that team is some outside assistance from a company, okay? Yes, it may be a little expensive in the short, short term, but boy, the time you save and the time you give, give yourself back uh, boy, that is a huge uh, investment for you. So here are some of the forms that we provide, a Medicare investigation checklist at the bottom. Again, that's a checklist you could put up on your wall. Uh, training logs, resolution forms, coding and, and billing audit. And, and we have specific steps that we recommend, a seven-step process for this. Now, last thing I'll say with, with Medicare and with the training is it has to be specific and it has to be annual. So CMS has their specific requirements uh, related to fraud, waste, and abuse. So make sure that you have all that taken care of. And if not, maybe we can help you out. Last piece to this puzzle of compliance cultures is HR and employment law. Now, a lot of people, I was talking with someone yesterday that said that they had policies and then they, they said, oh, well, our policies are here are your hours, here are your vacation days. It's much more than that, okay? And here's just a quick snapshot, okay? Yes, you have compensation. Yes, you have business hours. Do you have people that have outside employment? If so, that could really be a disruptive thing for your, your scheduling and for your practice and for the, the degree of care, right? Dress and appearance. This is a huge part of culture, that code of conduct uh, that, that kind of falls in, in line with this. Uh, as, we're, <laughs> as our nation uh, keeps evolving in, in many ways, uh, we have, we have uh, different policies that should be created for things like domestic partner benefit uh, and insurance and benefits uh, for you know different types of partnerships, uh, vacation, sick leave, holidays, maternity, educational assistance, workers' compensation, FMLA. We get questions on that all the time. Uh, do you have any questions about that? If so, go ahead and comment below. Uh, we're happy to you know maybe we can answer a few questions on that, and then a lot of people can have some clarification. Non-competition policies and discrimination and harassment. The very bottom one, I would say, is one of the most important because 
of how our nation continues to evolve. I mean, you have a lot of things with with trans transgender, with homosexuality, and people. I mean, you know, it's been that way for for years. The, the, these things, but as they become more open, uh, know that you need to make sure things are being documented. Make sure you have uh, a, a way a disciplinary action for you know kind of like sanction policies consequences based on different degrees of discrimination and harassment uh well it, it does seem like that uh, kind of is if it's just if you're discriminated it really does seem like you're uh, it kind of falls into one bracket doesn't it well at any rate have have your forms here are some of the forms that we have uh, forms you may not have of uh considered is, is how to evaluate a job applicant. You want to talk about culture, well, make sure that you have a good hiring process. Uh, make sure you understand how to comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, make sure you understand the harassment investigation guide if something happens in that regard. Okay, very, very important you have an HR policies and procedure binder and make sure you're uh, your team is very aware of, of what uh, happens in your office. Well, let's get into the incentive part of this. We are uh, very grateful for those of you who are customers and not customers who have seen us on forums. We, we have been on several different forums as, as a recommendation for compliance, for a simple compliance program. And, uh, I want to talk briefly uh, about what we're doing now and, and really what we're rolling the red carpet out uh, from now until the end of 2016, okay? So right now, if you'll see the bottom of this rewards program card, it says $100 gift card for each referral. So yes, we are doing that. And we have been, uh, we're, it's, it's great to reciprocate the appreciation that's demonstrated by by sharing HCSI with someone else. Well, for those of you uh, from today until the end of the year, anybody that you refer, each separate practice, uh, so uh, you know, chiropractic, physical therapy, dentist, uh, surgeons, podiatrists, etc. Uh, if you had five referrals, we are going to send you a $200 bonus, okay? And, and this, uh, this is, again, from October 13th, which is today, until the end of the year. And I've uh, thought, hey, this, this could be a great thing considering the holidays, uh, with all the <laughs> the extra food that you buy and with all the gift cards that are exchanged anyway, what uh, a remarkable opportunity. And, and where this is a slower time for a lot of practices, a lot of practices will take this, these next few months and they'll, they'll be doing their risk analyses, they'll be doing their training. And so compliance, for example, well, it should be on the top of your mind. And so in talking about HCSI, you have your phone, of course, you can call people, let them know about HCSI. Uh, specifically, you could say, hey, I just filled out this form, this business associate contract, and I learned about, uh, uh, about how, how to share absolutely what's minim minimally necessary with uh, a business associate, and, and HCSI helped me to understand which, what is a business associate, so that I can give the forms and so I can help them make sure that they are, are accountable. Uh, so, I mean, that could be a discussion. Okay, you could send an email or we have pre-crafted emails that we can send you and then you could forward those out to your colleagues. Continue, continue to add conferences and seminars. Talking about, uh, you know, most of these conferences have some sort of a compliance element. And so again, as that's top of mind, and you're already with HCSI, I would say this is probably the number one way 
yeah, about the number one way we were heard about other than these forums is uh, people going to conferences and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. Check it out. Social media network. We hope you'll share this presentation with others who are interested in how to cut the fat of compliance officer duties or, or who is just interested in knowing which compliance officer duties are the most important. Uh, hopefully we've done a good job illustrating these in, in a very basic way and uh, we're happy if you'll comment below we're, we're happy to to expound on on any of the things that we've shared okay neighbors what do I mean by that well if you're in a complex that has a dentist across the, the way or a physical therapist or a surgeon hey you know <laughs> uh, Again, as, as this is a top of mind thing, go across the way real quick and say, hey, you know what, I just watched this this uh, training. Uh, we have, HCSI does, has a bunch of trainings. Uh, would, would you guys be interested? I know it's really helped us out. Again, with business associates, you can talk with business associates about their contracts and then we also provide training and, and all the books and everything to make sure that they are in compliance with the laws. So you can talk with your business associates and having them use HCSI will ensure that they're receiving all the support they need to be compliant. We would suggest that what we've shared with you today is, is uh, are, are the, the, the milestones, the mile markers to help you and your journey of, of developing a, a culture of compliance. Yes, this is an ongoing thing. So if, if there's discouragement, know that, again, uh, this is something that it, it's, it, you know, there's a reason we have a puzzle piece. We, we believe there are a lot of pieces that go in this, but we invite you with, with any journey, a journey of, a, it's been said that a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. And we hope you'll continue to, to take more steps. We, we hope you'll ask some questions. Uh, last thing I'll say is we are offering, in the month of October, a $300 discount. Okay, that's $300. Uh, now, if, if someone uh, is, is referred, then, uh, then that's a $200 discount because we we do consider the one hundred dollars and that three hundred dollars off so we're happy to, to answer questions this has been a presentation on a culture of compliance on cutting the fat my name is lance king grateful to be with you i'm at l king at hcsi inc.com we're healthcare compliance solutions we'll talk to you soon